Good evening, the West Shore Photography Club. This is Wednesday, March the 20th, 2024. This evening, we have an informal session on cavern photography, and, and this is a prelude to our session that we're going to be having on, uh, on Saturday. So this is a very open uh, session. There's not a lot of structure to it, and um, Elaine Shook and I will be uh, conducting <clears throat> She'll, do, she'll be doing most of it. And uh, so we're going to start. I'm going to share my screen. And we will go with our PDF that we produced. Can you um, can you see this? OK. Yep. yep. The online. Can, can you the, enlarge it, Joe? I can make it bigger. And I am going to take the view. And I'm going to zoom in to maybe 200%. How's that? That's, That's better. It. Okay, good. You can move it. Can you move it up? Jeez. <laughs> I don't know. No, I mean the whole, um, the whole screen. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is what you mean, moving up like that? No, the, the whole screen that we're seeing. Um, can you move it up from the top of the, the top tab? The, doc the document's sitting low. Oh, how about like here? No, no, no. frame of the document, the software window, the window's oh. low. Oh. So go up to the top bar where it said where it shows the tab outline for Indian Echo. Can you grab yeah. that and move it up? I don't, th I can't know. It's as high yeah. as I can go. Okay, it's a Zoom thing. All right. Okay, so so we're going to start off, and um, like I said, it's going to be very informal. And so I'm going to ask Elaine if she could start us and talk a little bit about the Indian Echo Caverns and um, what we did to scout, scout it out and uh, some things we can plan on. Okay, um, I would like to suggest, since this is really casual, um, that if you have questions, don't don't be afraid to kind of interrupt when you feel you need an answer to something right away. I think we'll have plenty of time. Um, if it gets to the point that we're getting off topic or we're running out of time, then we may ask you to hold your questions till the end. But other than that, um, feel free to ask away. I, I want this to be rather conversational rather than a presentation type um, workshop. Uh, so Joe and I did uh, go to Indian Echo Caverns about a month ago for our first trip to get a feel for um, what the lighting situation would be like and what the opportunities would be in terms of um, uh, composition and you know what what kinds of of photographs we might be able to get. Um, we both were really impressed with with the beauty of the place. It was nothing that I ever expected. I had been to Lurie Caverns a number of years ago um, and that is much bigger, but it's been a while and I just forgot about what a beautiful setting it is underground. And part of the beauty of it was the low light with the contrast in the artificial lighting and the shadows. It was, just lent such drama to the place, but also the fact that there was a lot more color in the rocks and the walls and the um, the outgrowths and um, within the caverns is, was just totally amazing to me. Um, we will have a tour guide, um, which will give us a little bit of, of, of ge geological information as well as historical information as we go through the caves. And I think that will help you um, as well in, in to appreciate what's, what's in there and some of the obstacles as well that you will encounter. And we will encounter some obstacles and I'll talk about those in a minute. Um, but first of all, because of, of the tight spaces, namely in the walkways, the passageways that go from room to room, um, it's impossible to bring tripods or even a monopod in there. If you were doing it alone, it would be possible. But when you're with many other photographers, not so much. We'd be tripping over each other or tripping each other. Um, and also, we would not be allowed to touch the walls because they can do some, even touching them with your hands can do some serious damage to the, the um, 
mineral deposits that form all this beautiful texture and color in the walls. Um, so no tripods or monopods will be allowed. We did have to restrict the numbers of participants in this group to 20 simply because of the space issues. We wanted um, to have all of the photographers that attended enough space so that they weren't having to wait for other photographers um, to get out of their way. Um, so we ended up with um, 20. We did fill to full capacity on this trip and we intend to divide into two groups once we get there. And we will, each group will have a, um, a tour guide and each group will start at opposite ends of the caverns so that we really will only have 10 in a group and there will be plenty of room to spread out that way. We will kind of meet in the middle, which is a large room, and then we'll cross paths and go the opposite directions. Um, there, it is very low light, as I said. There is absolutely no natural light in the caverns. Um, the only lighting in there is spotlighting, it, but it is throughout the caverns, uh, fairly bright spotlights. It's directed at certain um, spots where there are, for example, where there's a couple of lakes or um, some interesting outgrowth or interesting uh, limestone walls or whatnot. Um, so that is um, the only light that we have to deal with. It can be challenging in a couple of ways. Number one, you can't avoid photographing those lights in most cases because there's not enough room to maneuver your body to get those spotlights behind <clears throat> um, a rock or something where you won't where it won't be visible in the image. So that is one of those things we have to deal with in post processing. Um, we cannot bring flash any type of flash or artificial lighting in with us. The reason being that with other photographers, of course, um, it's not doable trying to get a photograph when there are other cameras flashing all around you. And it simply isn't that dark that you really need it, um, given the recommendations on, on exposure settings and whatnot that we are going to give you. Um, also, all of the cavern walls and the floors are very wet. So trying to use a flash or any kind of even off camera LED light would create a lot of glare and specular highlights, which you don't want in your image. Um, there are other obstacles um, such as other photographers, but we hopefully will be working around that. Um, and some railings in places where there might be like a walkway over a, a <clears throat> a little creek that runs through in one place, for example, um, or railings in front of the lake areas, <clears throat> excuse me, um, that are like guardrails. And it's hard to get a good photo through those railings. Um, so in some cases, you will need to be removing some of those obstacles. Um, and you should plan on that. And we'll, Joe will give you some suggestions on how to do that in post. Okay, um, getting down to the cavern, there are 72 stairs. Um, they are very safe stairs. They're covered stairs. Um, they're not steep, so they're not difficult to navigate. Um, however, it is not handicap accessible. The, so there are no ramps, um, no wheelchairs allowed in the caverns. Um, but for those of you who may have been concerned that 72 stairs down and up would be too difficult to do. Believe me, it's not. Um, <laughs> I sometimes have a hard time getting up and down several um, flights of stairs, but it wasn't difficult for me at all. And there are resting spots on each of the landings where if you wish, you can rest. Um, walking within the cavern is pretty easy. Um, you do need to wear closed toe shoes to protect your toes in case you kick a rock, which we hope you won't be doing. Um, but it's also very wet down there. So you don't want to be walking in sandals. Um, again, I, I think I mentioned uh, we are not allowed to touch or bump the cavern walls because of the damage that can be done even by a slight bump. Um, 
The temperature in there is fairly cool, but not cold. It's a constant temperature of 52 degrees year round. So it feels cool in the summer. It feels warm in the winter time. So dress accordingly. 52 degrees was not uncomfortable for me at all with just a light jacket. Um, it can be kind of drippy. The second time we went, it was drippier than the first time we went. So it wasn't, um, <laughs> I wasn't too surprised when I came out with wet hair. So you might want to wear a lightweight rain jacket if you don't want to get wet, or even a little hoodie to cover your hair if that bothers you. Um, but don't plan on getting all gussied up or um, styling your hair before you go because it won't be styled when you get out. Mm -hmm. um, that's about all I have to say about the caverns themselves. Joe, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah. Uh, only on the uh, on the E working around the obstacles, you will get people in your pictures. There, there's no doubt about that. And if you try and think you're going to wait until those people move on, it ain't going to happen uh, because they're just it it just is very narrow. So we're going to show you uh, in post processing how you can get rid of those things like wires and those uh, floodlights and things like that. So there will be obstacles. And one other thing on the lighting that really drove me nuts is they have a lot of lights in their floodlights and spotlights that like Elaine said, but they, when they, I think they bought the light bulbs and they were on sale somewhere because they have all different color temperatures. One may be um, uh, 4,700, another may be 5,500 uh, Kelvin. And so you have some with a nice soft uh, golden light and others will be like hot, white hospital light. So you just have to be aware of that and be able to accomplish, uh, to remove that if you want to in post-processing. But that's all I have. Okay. Can you move the document up a little I bit? I can. Mm -hmm. You tell me when I should stop. Stop. Okay. Okay, as far as gear goes, I think Joe already mentioned a wide angle lens is really good. Um, there are many opportunities to get um, shots with a lot of depth uh, looking down the corridors or the passageways, uh, whatever you want to call them, where there's something interesting lit in the distance. Um, but yet you've got some um, interesting rocks with detail right close to you. So a wide angle is good um, for getting that sense of depth. Um, it also does help with, uh, to some degree, it does help with your depth of field so you can get more things in focus with a wider lens. Um, but there are also some opportunities to get um, some interesting abstract shots or close-up shots of the rocks themselves um, to show that or highlight that texture and the color, which is absolutely beautiful. I did a combination of both, um, both wide angle and um, in one case I was shooting at 90 millimeters, which on my camera, which is a micro four thirds is the equivalent of 180. Um, didn't do a lot of that. Um, there's so much to do with a wide angle lens that it's really not necessary unless you're, you really want to get a lot of that. Um, no telephoto lens would be necessary. There are no bats in there that you would need to shoot um, with, a, with a long reach. Um, and it simply would be too difficult to carry a telephoto lens, a long telephoto lens in there. But up to, um, up to 100 or 120 certainly is not a problem. And I do recommend it. Uh, a zoom lens that will give you a little more versatility in that respect. Um, obviously, you're going to want to bring a an empty memory card in your camera and a full battery if you're going to be doing any kind of focus stacking or any kind of bracketing or um, bursting. That battery will go very fast. Um, so bring a spare and bring a spare memory card as well. Um, ideally, you would carry these in some kind of a jacket with pockets that will accommodate this. Um, we are encouraging no bags whatsoever if you can handle it, if you can put your spare lens in your pockets as well as your accessories. 
Um, backpacks are just kind of out of the question, just because it'd be too easy to bump up against uh, the walls with the backpacks. Although we will allow a small accessory bag for an extra lens if you really need it. Uh, one that kind of fits close against your body and won't swing against walls or other people. Um, in most cases, filters won't be necessary. Uh, there was a couple of spots where Joe tried a polarizer lens because there was um, some uh, magnificent specular highlights on a very wet rock that happened to be right in the limelight of one of those spots, the spotlights. So it was very difficult to photograph. Joe, did you have any success using your polarizer on that? Uh, not really, because I'll tell you, in the in the in the cavern, trying to change lenses or filters is a real pain. Uh, and by the time you get it out, screw it in, adjust it, you know, you're wasting so much time. There's only a few cases where you would really need it. So, 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 so that's it. Okay. Any questions on that section before we move on? So. Saturday night. I am going to uh, mute everybody here, and then I'm going to ask if you would um, unmute. There we go. Mute. Okay, I got them. Very good. Should everybody be muted? Okay, so come down to the next section, which is the hand holding, uh, because you can't. You, you're going to have to hand hold, and your shutter speeds are going to be kind of low. You may be. Um, they put three pictures. You know, Fifteen. Uh, oh, did I not? Yeah. Can everybody hear me? Can you just uh, not talk uh, or mute yourself, if you would, please? Apparently, I didn't do that correctly. So. Um, you, you need, you're going to use uh, your image stabilization on both your lens and your, your camera body if you have that for sure. Uh, you uh, will definitely want to be using the shutter speed, you know, as low as you can go and be able to take a an image without camera movement in it. And that really varies by person. Some people can do, you know, like 1 20th of a second at, at a 100 millimeter lens, and some people need to be at 100 on one hundredth of a second for that. So it really depends. But there are some techniques, and I and I'm putting these up this up here because I see this in a lot of our trips, is what you should and should not do in a situation like this in a cave. Okay. Like on the left there, you see the young lady holding their camera out in front of her. And so the stability of that is not too good because it's sitting out there with no base of reference. Whereas a second lady has her arms in close to her body and she has the camera using her forehead. So she kind of has a tripod. Her head and her two arms almost sort of form a, a tripod situation. And uh, so that is a really good way to hold it. And I really suggest you, you take that to heart because you will want to use low shutter speeds because you don't want to have high ISOs. So that's going to be real important. And another technique that a lot of people use is this one right here, where you breathe in, hold your breath, and take a series of fast shots, like two or three, something like this. <sighs> click, click, click. <laughs> Let them out. And and that really helps that non-breathing while you're trying to take a picture, holding your breath works well and taking more than one shot because the first shot will be one where you push down on the shutter. And then the second one, um, you, you'll, your, your finger will already be there. So you're not really squeeze, you're not really pushing down anymore. You're already there. And uh, so that can help uh, a good bit in terms of... Um, holding your camera. I Joe, know that I noticed that, um, can you hear me, Joe? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you still hear me? I don't know if I'm muted or no, not. You're, no, you're fine. I can hear you. I, um, I noticed in the middle picture, she also has her left hand supporting the bottom of the lens, which I think helps a lot too, as yeah. opposed to the one to the right, which is not the ideal position. She's holding the frame of the camera with both hands. Yeah, that's a good point. Yep. Okay. Um, camera settings. Can you see that? Okay. 
the we're recommending a capture format of raw only and no jpeg we we feel pretty strongly about that because you're going to get a lot of noise in your images and we're going to talk about how you can get rid of that but if you have a raw format you have a much much better chance of getting a quality image uh, out of it when you put it through the software that'll do noise reduction. So we strongly recommend that. If you can't do it, uh, then, then you can't do it. And you just use JPEG. Um, and, uh, but we, we strongly recommend that. We, uh, and if anybody has any questions as we go through this, uh, just let, let us know and or shout them out. Uh, the white balance, we're going to suggest auto white balance. And the reason for that is because the, the, um, the mixed uh, lighting uh, formats, as I mentioned, like the really warm lights and the really uh, harsh lights that you get from the like 5,500 Kelvin uh, lights, it's gonna be, you go crazy if you're gonna try and balance it out because you can't because they're, they're all over the board. So just, we suggest use auto white balance. I know I use that on both of my trips. Uh, Elaine, did you use auto white balance? I always use auto balance, auto white balance. It's so easy to correct in, in um, post that I, you know, it's one more button that I don't need to adjust when I'm planning a shot. So. Um, the focus mode. Now this may terminology may not be the same for everybody, but um, here you're not going to have any movements. So you don't need to have the continuous uh, focusing. You don't need to have, uh, subject recognition and all of those really cool things that some of the newer cameras have. If you have a single focus point, that's really all you need is to have a single focus point and focus on what you consider to be the most important part and then shoot. Okay. Now, if you do that, we're going to get into a little bit later on at some of the settings. You got to take into account your f-stop for depth of field, but we'll talk about that later. But that's the focus mode that we recommend. Nothing fancy at all. You don't want auto. If you have auto focus, just let you, camera, you make the decision for me. You don't want that. You want to control what is definitely going to be super sharp. And you want to use a single focus point for that. That would be my recommendation. And how do you feel about that, Elaine? Do you feel the same way? I absolutely agree. In fact, there's various situations anywhere that I use anything but a single focus point because most of my photography really um, involves isolated subjects um, where the focus is crucially important to me on that subject. Uh, and I do not like the camera making that decision for me. Obviously, the camera doesn't know what I have in mind, what my vision is for it. So that's one thing that I do like to control. Okay. So, so Joe, how yeah. should we meter the camera? Oh, we're going to get to that. We're going to get to that. No, we're just working our way down here, Jim. Okay. I, yeah, I didn't really <laughs> try to on that. Okay. Well, we're going to, we'll talk about that. That's important. Okay. Uh, the frame rate, uh, I'm I'm going to suggest, this is, this is me now talking this, and none, but nobody else maybe think the way I do on this, but I always shoot off like three or four or five frames a second. So if I put my camera up to my bottom, my face and I'm photographing the scene, I'm not going to go click. And so I'm done. I walk away. I'm going to go click, 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 click. Okay. Because if I'm hand holding, particularly, I have a much higher rate of success on the second and the third image than I do on the first image because of that pushing it down. Now that just may be me. Okay. But that's, that's what I do. And I suggest you might want to do that because you're going to have really slow shutter speeds in there. And if you take three or four oh. or five, seven sections, a session, a, a, images in real quick succession, you're going to have one of them at least will be good. And one thing I we suggest you, and you better not do it, is don't use a self-timer in there because, you know, those self-timers are designed for somebody to go in front of it, uh, of the lens, and take a picture of the people at the, at the party with them in it. So they have that little obnoxious, goofy light to go blink, 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 blink. Oh, here you go. And don't do that because that light will just drive you nuts and drive the folks, your your buddies, uh, crazy when they see that light because that'll actually ruin an image. I mean, I've been in night photography sessions where people have done that and it just really works well. And like in my camera, 
I can't even turn that light off. So I have to put a piece of gaffer tape over my light because there's no button in our camera to turn that sucker off. So, so I have a comment on the um, frame rate. Um, yes. A lot of the mirror, newer mirrorless cameras have options for frame rate, and some of them are really high, over 20 frames per second, um, and in certain uh, modes, more than 50 frames per second. I would not advise that here because you're not trying to shoot, again, a moving object, and um, you're really going to use up a lot of space unnecessarily on your card and just have a whole lot of duplicates if you go that fast. So if you have a uh, just like a, a low uh, continuous shooting mode uh, that gives you even five to 10 frames per second would be ideal. Okay, good. Shooting mode, some cameras have this, they have the aperture, that's what the S stands for, shutter for shutter priority, uh, program for program mode, and M for manual. Um, we're we're gonna suggest to you that you use manual mode. And that means you set the shutter speed, the aperture, and the ISO. The camera does no exposure settings for you at all. You make all of the decisions with those three settings. And so you're gonna set the aperture, the shutter speed. You might wanna use auto ISO, but you could. Uh, but I'm rec I would recommend that you set all three of those. So that means that you really know how to set all three of those because it's gonna be dark. And being in the dark cave and somebody's behind you wants to get a shot and you're trying to figure out how do I change my ISO can be problematic. So just make sure you're aware of that. And we really strongly recommend you use one of those. If you have to use any of the automated ones, I would suggest you use the shutter priority because you're going to want to set it at the lowest shutter speed that you can use and let the other ones float. But I really think you want to use manual. Any questions on the mode before we get into the exposure? Okay, into the exposures. There's only three things I think most of us know that really control your exposure. Uh, the aperture and the shutter speed are the only two things that control how much light you go in, okay? Those are the only two things, the aperture and the shutter speed. The ISO is after the fact, so to speak, and all it is is like a volume control and says, oh, I got to make this thing brighter. So it does it artificially. So your main concern is going to be the aperture and the shutter speed. The aperture, I mean, ideally what you would want to use in a cave, want to use in a situation like this would probably be an F-16 because there's a long hallways, but you can't do that if you use F-16 and your shutter speed is going to have to be down to maybe uh, maybe 30 seconds, and you can't hold that. And uh, so the only other thing you're going to have to, would have to do would have to have an ISO so high that it wouldn't be worthwhile. So you, we're going to suggest that you use a more of an open uh, aperture like f4, 5, 6. And if you're really anal about getting really sharp through uh, the whole image, then you're going to want to do a focus stack, which we'll talk to you about later. But if you don't use the focus stack, which I didn't do on a number of the shots, and I thought they were okay, okay? I mean, I can go in and see that it's, I should, I really would like it to be sharper, but I didn't want to do that in that particular situation because I knew most of our members probably wouldn't do that. So I, I um, but you want to use that. If you had like an F2 lens, okay, those million dollar ones, um, you could use that, but then your shallow depth of field is going to be a really a problem. So I would suggest something like that. And the shutter speed as slow as you can go. And you might want to practice that a little bit when you're in there. Take some shots and just as we get in, because when we get in, we're going to have a little baby orientation and there's one killer shot, I think anyways, that everybody should get before people start going out and we can all take the shot at the same time. Practice that a little bit and see how slow you can go in there and maybe hold off on that second or third cup of coffee before you get there. And speaking of that, by the way, there are bathrooms there, okay, before you get down to the, uh, to the cavern. And then the high ISO. 
And I know everybody gets really bent out of shape about ISO. I never go above 6,400 and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I'm telling you, you're going to be going higher than that. And uh, and I have, and I'm going to show you uh, a tool that, that's in Lightroom and all the software programs have one that can enable you to mitigate the noise in the high ISO um, situation. And that would be another thing that you would want to test. But when you test it, at, uh, let's say at your first shot or two that you take at high ISO, you're going to be disappointed what you see on the screen. That's why we're going to show you what you're going to see on the screen without high ISO um, uh, uh, remediation software inside the camera. Um, you you're not uh, you, you'll be disappointed with that at uh, at the at the scene, but you can get rid of it afterwards. And uh, so those are the three things: the aperture, the shutter speed, and the ISO. Any comments on that? And by the way, those comments that I made are very um, biased by me. So those are just what I would do. And Elaine, how do you feel about that? Those things. Um, well, Joe, you know that I'm shooting with, with a much different camera than you are. So my approach is a little bit different. Um, with a Micro Four Thirds camera, its biggest disadvantage is, of course, the um, lower dynamic range than you would have on your full frame camera. Uh, so it doesn't do as well in low light as yours does, nor does it handle noise quite as well. But um, to compensate for that, with a Hi. setting such as f5.6, um, it lets in as much light as your camera does at 5.6. However, it gives you double the depth of field. So when I'm shooting at 5.6, which is what I did shoot at, um, most, most of my shots were at 5.6. I was getting the equivalent of f11. Which is really good. Um, still not quite as sharp as I would normally like in a landscape photo because I like in landscape I like everything within the frame to be tack sharp, um, which is going to be virtually not impossible but difficult in the yeah. cave setting. But f11 for me was very doable, and I didn't have to raise my ISO above 6400. I would say the majority of mine were shot at 6400 S ISO and 5.6 and um, didn't really have to um, lower yes. my shutter speed below one, in most cases, one thirtieth of a second. There were a few that were a little slower than that. But if your camera has a good stabilization system and you have a good stabilization process yourself for holding that camera, 1 30th is usually pretty doable. Um, but it, again, it kind of depends upon the camera that you're using. Any crop sensor um, camera is going to have a greater depth of field than a um, full frame. The d disadvantage though, again, being that it doesn't do nearly as well in low light um, as a full frame camera does. Okay. Okay, good. Any questions from anybody on that? Very good. Come down here and I'm suggesting, do you see the big black box in the middle of this? No. Uh, no, okay, good. I'm trying to get rid of it. Okay, which you can't see, so that's okay, good. I'm just gonna move it out of the way. Um, test shots, we are going to suggest you take a few test shots, as I mentioned. Uh, uh, and the reason why you would do that when you get into the cave, take your test, test shots, you're probably gonna use those same shots, those settings basically throughout the whole, whole uh, cavern. They don't change dramatically. Um, gonna suggest you look at the histogram on the back of your camera. Because when you're shooting in a low light situation, what you don't want to do is shoot it underexposed and say, oh, I'm just going to take in, in, in Lightroom or, or Photoshop or whatever program you use, I'm going to boost my exposure back up again by taking the exposure slider and moving it to the right. You don't want to do that because if you don't have data in of light data on your image, it's very hard to be able to increase the exposure without generating a lot of noise. You're better off 
to photograph with good light and not dramatically underexposed at the point of taking the picture, then you are trying to do that in post-processing by goosing up the, um, the, uh, the lighting in through a slider. So try and get a good exposure at that point. Do that, look at your histogram. You're gonna have some things on the black. You'll have more on to the left side of the histogram and you're gonna be, uh, it's gonna be, um, it'll, it'll be darker there. It'll be darker in there. So you're gonna have a darker histogram, so to speak, but a tilting towards the left. You're gonna have specular highlight for those lights that we talked about. So you might want to uh, turn on blinkies on the back of your camera and blinkies, and I think all cameras have it. And what it does is it enables you to, um, see what is gonna be overexposed because it'll start blinking and you might wanna do that. And keep in mind that those lights that you're gonna have some of the harsh lights and if they're close to a wall that has water on it, they're gonna be over, they're gonna be blown out. You're not gonna, and you don't wanna honor just those because if you try and honor those by reducing your exposure, you will have a much too dark of an image. So just be aware of that. And you won't be able to, um, uh, avoid the hot spots, and you will have to cut them out later on. I'm going to show you how you can do that uh, so that you you don't have to worry about those hot spots, so to speak. So I'm suggesting some test shots. So um, if I could add just one thing please. to that. Um, check your depth of field as well. If you have a focus peaking or a, um, a depth of field preview button, use it for those first few shots to see what your um, depth of field is gonna look like, to see how much of the image is actually gonna be in focus. Uh, that that will help a lot. Okay, good. Um, we're gonna talk about, let me get this box out of here just a second here. Um, noise reduction software. This is, and you're going to be using this. You're going to want to use this if you don't have it. And it's part of most, like on one, capture one, uh, GIMP, uh, Photoshop Elements, Photoshop. They all have some form of a noise reduction software, and you're going to want to use that. Uh, I know when I came back for the first time we did a trip uh, over there, Elaine and I went, I took all of my images from the trip and I went in and I, I selected them all and I did a batch of, of noise reduction on every image before I even touched an image. And it took about 45 minutes to do the 350 images and it and it put noise reduction on all of them and it, and I'm going to show you how I did that and what the results were but I, you're going to want to do that so just keep in mind that you know, they're going to look really really um, rough in the field and you can use third party software like I have here on uh, Topaz you can use Lightroom Denoise and keep in mind that all noise reduction software will soften the image to an extent. And, um, and we'll talk about that. And you may want to use it as a, a little bit of, um, of sharpening on the images uh, because of that. So um, I'm, I have here, this is, this is, this is for me uh, to show, I'm going to show you this in a minute. Um, but the, the, the tools to enhance the images afterwards in post-processing, maybe a little bit of clarity, texture, and sharpening. And I have to tell you, um, the, the, from that standpoint, Cavern software is really, uh, caverns are really easy to photograph because you have nothing but really rocks and crevices and all kinds of stuff in there. And so if you're not quite as sharp and if you're, if you have a little bit more noise, it can handle it because it is a gritty kind of a, of a, a situation. Now, my second one under B2, add some grain. You might think of nuts on that, but Elaine's going to talk to you about that when she gets into her image. It's absolutely stellar. Uh, later on, she's going to talk to you about adding some grain and why she did that. Uh, we're going to talk about how to get rid of people. And they have a lot of, um, when they put the lights on up, uh, they didn't really hide them and they didn't hide the cables for them either. So you may wanna, you're gonna wanna do some of that. And uh, so we're gonna show you that. Photographs, Photoshop's generative fill tool. 
uh, lightning, darkening. Uh, we're going to talk about that. And before I get into the demonstration, let's talk about the general comments. Uh, Elaine, do you want to talk about this part of it? Sure. Um, <clears throat> well, I think the first one is is uh, not a problem with any of you, but it's it's always good to remember that that when you are getting excited about a shot, you, you have to still retain respect for the photographers around you. It's it's sometimes easy to get so lost in what you're doing that you become oblivious to other photographers who are trying to get the same shot. So just be respectful. Um, if you see someone who is is taking a shot down a long uh, passageway, um, don't walk in front of them. Um, or if you are getting prepared to move down there, let them know that you're behind there. Ask them if they're ready um, for you to get in front. Just be respectful. Um, knowing your camera and and how to set the settings is is critical. If if you go in there not really being intimately familiar with your camera, it's going to be very difficult, especially in the low light to fiddle around with it. But but most importantly, know what it's capable of, um, know what it's not capable of, and know how to compensate for those things that it doesn't do well. Um, if you're planning to do something new like um, focus stacking, practice before you get there. Um, feel very comfortable with what you're doing before you start experimenting in these caverns. Um, it's it, it just it, something like that takes time to learn and you won't have the time in the caverns to to learn it as you go. But more importantly, have fun. This really, really is a mystical, magical place. You will love it. Um, there are just so many photo opportunities there. Just have fun with it. Okay, so I'm going. Thank you, uh, Elaine. I'm going to go now to uh, Lightroom and we'll talk about some of the uh, opportunities that you're going to have. So I'm going to bring up Lightroom and let me ask, can everybody see that uh, image on the screen? Uh, yeah. Okay, you can? Good. Okay. I'm going to very briefly go through... No, I don't see an image. You don't no, see an I image? No, I don't, don't, don't see the document. There's no image. Oh, there's no image. And let me see. Yeah, I don't see it either, Joe. Oh, I don't either. Okay. The document uh, is still up. Yeah, okay. I I can see that. Let me see. I am... <clears throat> hmm. How come I'm going to do a new share and I'm going to do Lightroom Classic? Can you see that now? Yes. No. yes. You, you can? Yes. Okay, yes. good. Um, I'm going to briefly go through, um, let me get some of these windows out of the way here that you can't see. There we go. Okay. I got them over there. Perfect. I am going to go and look for an attribute of one. I'm going to flip through some images here just for you to see. Uh, can you see that in full screen? Yes. Okay, good. And let me let me not do that because I want to do this in a single one so you can see the settings that we use. So get an idea of what the f-stop shutter speed ISOs were and what the um, uh, the millimeter lens were. I'm just going to go through these briefly so you can see um, what some of the settings were. And if you have any questions on this, don't hesitate. You can see on this one, it has an ISO of 12,800. Okay, it's pretty high. Um, let me see, go to the uh, go to the next one here. Well, okay, let's take this one here. This is 12,800. And these Joe, are, Joe, yes. Was 12,800 the highest you went? No, I went higher than that. Uh, and I have to, and you'll see here, I, I have one in here that's higher than that. But yes, now this has been noise reduced. And I'm going to show you some before and afters with that. But these have been 
annoys me to do. I just want you to, this part of this is just to show you what ISOs I was using, okay? And you'll see that some of them are narrower than that or shorter than that, okay? And here's one. This is one of the ones that had the goofy lighting and, and I didn't make any changes to it uh, on this one here. Another one with the goofy lighting. This is 22,800. And um, this is one where I tried to put a uh, polarizer to get rid of some of this. And uh, that was too much of a pain because we were there on our first trip and there was a tour group going and I had to work around them. We both had to work around them. So we didn't, uh, I didn't end up doing that. But that was a 22,800. Here's another one. And by the way, I can't, we can't, we were back the second time. I can't find where I took that picture, but I did take it there, honest. Okay. I don't know where it was. So we're going to try and find that again. This is a 16,000 um, ISO on this one. Again, if you have any questions on these, just as hollow them out. One thing we tried to do was to get this kind of a leading line in our images. And uh, let me go back here like that like that and like this. We, if Because if you just take a picture of a rock like that, that doesn't look too interesting, but here you have some interest in it. So we went for that concept of trying to get some uh, pathways, so to speak. And there's a lot of pathways like that. And Elaine was saying that you have to follow the guy because it, you'll hit your head on some of this stuff. Look at this little boy and he's almost right there. So you have to duck down to get to some of the areas. And uh, so... Let me see here, come in here. And this was another one, but this is not nearly as good as what Elaine's gonna show you later on. Um, and this one had a 11,400. And this one is 28,800. This was much brighter now. Okay, so I'm only using a, a 2,800 um, ISO and I'm using it at 18 millimeters. And um, so here's another one, it was 2,200. And I think, and then another, our last one here was at 16,000, okay? So that gives you an idea of just what we were uh, shooting with and uh, ISOs and shutter speeds. Elaine, how about, did you kind of go on, other than the fact that your highest ISO was 6,400, right? It was intentionally. Okay. I actually capped it in my camera. I wouldn't allow it to go over 6,400. I was using auto ISO in all of mine. Okay. Um, and I I am one of those that don't like to use ISOs over 6,400, um, not because I'm afraid of it, but I know my camera's limitations. And the Micro Four Thirds camera um, looks much noisier than your full camera, your full frame camera would at that same ISO speed. Okay. I'm going to go to a, my collection now, and we're going to look at a couple of um, uh, images. And I'm going to take these two, and I'm going to view them side by side. And you're going to see that this one here has a DNG on it. And that means it's been uh, processed with noise production. And this NEF means it's a, a raw out of the camera kind of a shot. And that's not really true because I did do some minor um, uh, uh, processing on it. But my real reason for doing this is I want you to see this here. When I show you the noise at the 12,800, this is what we got. And this is putting it through uh, Lightroom's uh, noise reduction software. And you can see the dramatic improvement that it made. And look at some of the details in here, which you can hardly even see over here. It just wiped them out. I have personally used Topaz Denoise for a long time, and that was my favorite go-to program. But when Lightroom came out with theirs, it made it so much, in my estimation, better in the sense that we don't get artifacts from the noise reduction or from the sharpening. So I highly, um, I'm highly uh, happy with that software. And I wanted to show you, this is what you're gonna see on the back of your camera. 
and you're going to say, you're going to freak out and say, oh my God, what am I going to do? Just keep in mind that you can do something like this using your noise reduction software. And um, so I'm going to um, uh, go back to here and I'm going to show you, this is a, a scene that was non no, uh, noise reduced. And then here's one that is reduced. So I'm gonna show you this one now and talk about some of the obstacles you're gonna run into. When we first go in, we're gonna be in an area and this is where we're all gonna stand behind this line, so to speak. And we're gonna shoot right down that little alleyway there. That's a really, really cool shot. And we'll, be able, we'll all be able to do that. But you're gonna get this railing in and you are going to, um, well, oh, excuse me, what did I do? Uh, where to go here, just a second here. And you're gonna get that railing in and you're gonna have that light up here that we have to get rid of. So to do that, uh, we're gonna go into Photoshop. And I know some of you are gonna say, I don't wanna go to Photoshop. Well, I'm one of those guys too. So I'm gonna edit into Photoshop and I wanna show you, can you see my Photoshop images here now? No. Can you see that? Can you see over here where it has properties and canvas and all that stuff? No, Joe, we can't no, see that. Oh, can't. We can't. Okay. See that. That's why I it's still to... showing your Lightroom. Yeah. Okay. I thought that might be. So I'm going to stop the share. And now I'm going to share. And I'm going to go to Photoshop. Okay. Now you can see the Photoshop stuff over here, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. So the first thing we're going to do, we want to get rid of this railing. Okay. So I'm going to use this tool called the remove tool. And if you've not used the remove tool before, you, you're going to want to use this. It's really cool. And where it says remove after every stroke for this one, I'm going to turn that off right here. Turn that one off. And I am going to Take this, I'm gonna go click. I'm gonna hold the shift key and go click. And you saw that selecting that railing, okay? And the next thing I'm gonna do is hit enter and it's going to take it away. Okay, I'm gonna do it again. I'm going to do shift. It's going to select it. I'm going to hit enter. And I'm going to get rid of it. I'm not going to do a whole bunch here because it's going to get boring. So I'm going to do that. And then I'm going to do that. I'm going to hit enter. And that's what I'm going to do. So that's going to be true for like uh, things like, um, let me put the tool away. Uh, like from here, there's some power, there's some electrical lines right in here. I have shadows from that railing. However, I can't draw a straight line, which you saw me doing that. Go shift, I, I click, and then shift. That's not a straight line, so I can't do that. So I'm going to remove this, and I'm going to use my this little thing, and I'm going to come along here and highlight that shadow. And I'm going to get rid of that. Okay, And you may have to do it twice like that. And that is a magical tool that you're going to use. You're going to use that on this. You're going to use that on this. And anywhere else you have some, some bad stuff. And over in here is where I'm going to use it. Right in here to try and mitigate that light and I got rid of it. So that is what kind of stuff you're going to do in post-processing and but you're also going to do that for things like these cables in here and for down in here you're going to want to do it for in here and um, let me see there's no other cables that I see um, but that is one of the tools that you're going to want to use to get rid of stuff. So when you see that, 
and you say, oh, I don't want to, I want to crop it more in camera so I can avoid it. You can really get rid of it in post-processing. You truly can. So I wanted to mention that to you. Okay. The, ne the next thing I wanted to mention, and I'm going to now stop share, and I'm going to go back to my Lightroom, and that is uh, Lightroom is right here. Okay. And I'm going to go to here. And I'm going to take this image here. We have two images here, side by side. Okay. And I'm going to take the tabs off. And I'm going to zoom in. DNG is one that's been uh, noise reduced. This is the original. And let's just pull up something like here and see the difference in the noise right in here versus after it's been removed, okay? The DNG works really well, okay? And uh, the uh, noise reduction works really well. So we're gonna, but I, what I wanna show you this one here is how we need to get rid of part of Elaine, okay? And you're gonna have people in your scene. There's gonna be someone standing up here and you're gonna say, can you move to the right a little bit so they get behind this rock? And they're going to do that and maybe and be real nice about it, but they're still going to hang over like this, okay? So you're going to have to get rid of that person. And so what we're going to do is you're going to right-click and you're going to edit into Photoshop, and which you can't see yet, okay? So I'm going to stop share, and I'm going to share my screen for Photoshop, Okay. Everybody can see this, the Photoshop properties over here? Yep. Okay, good. So I'm going to go and take the lasso tool. This is the generative fill, and I want to show you this because you're going to use it. And I use this a lot on all the images that I had shown you. If you've never used generative fill, you notice how I am not going close to the person. I'm going to around the person. And that's just the way it works. And I am going to, oh shoot, I, got, I have a, a thing you can't see in the way here. So I'm going to do um, uh, edit generative film. And what I'm going to say is nothing here, and I'm going to have it generate these rocks it's going to make these rocks and we'll see how it does it's cooking it's cooking there so it took elaine and replaced her with those rocks and it gives you a couple alternatives this it gives you this one give you that one you like that how it did it how about that one? And you can choose. And if you don't like any of them, you can do it again and again and again until you get it the way you like. I'm showing you that because if somebody's in there, you can get rid of them. And being a, a cave with all this crunchy rocks around, it is much easier to hide it. If I were to go in and um, look at this, you're going to see that there's not much of an artifacts in here that is generated it. Okay. It's, it's, it's truly hidden it very well. You can't really tell. I mean, I would defy it to, to uh, tell me, defy that. Okay. So those are the things that we wanted to mention. And I do have one more. We have one more that I wanted to you to see in Lightroom, and that is this one here. And this is Elaine's shot. So Elaine, I'd like you to tell everybody what you did to make this absolutely look drop dead gorgeous. Okay, well, I will say um, that this was probably my favorite scene in the caverns. Um, I. I just had this vision for it that was just, it just kind of knocked my socks off. Um, I loved it, but it was probably the most challenging for me um, to get it well exposed the way that I wanted it to be um, so that I would see what I saw in my vision. Um, 
this happened to be, um, it had some pretty heavy contrast in it. So the rocks in the front were heavily shadowed, but there was very, very bright light in that center part where you see all those beautiful um, crystallized rocks in the background over the lake. Um, and that high contrast made it very difficult to expose. Um, Jim, you had asked a question about metering. Um, and I wanted to bring that up here. I was metering in a matrix or evaluative mode, um, which I usually do for landscapes. It seems to work the best. Um, but what it did in this situation was create a um, very flat looking image. So while this was my favorite scene, the raw file was probably the most disappointing in terms of impact. It was very colorless. It was had very little contrast. Um, it was just a blah photo. Um, but I knew it had potential because I knew what I saw. I knew what I envisioned. And so I worked on it for a very, very long time to get it to what I wanted it to be. Um, the first thing I did uh, was to denoise it in Lightroom, just as Joe did. Um, the, the noise wasn't terrible, so I probably could have gotten away with not denoising it at all. It was at 6,400. Um, I shot this at 1 50th of a second. Um, it was uh, using my wide angle lens at 12 millimeters. Um, ISO 6,400, I guess I said that. Um, uh, when I denoised it, it didn't, of course, help any of the issues with contrast and color. Um, but what it did was smooth out a lot of the rocks that already looked smooth. If you look at the rocks that are kind of slowed down on the right, they were naturally very smooth because that water is continually running down them and just smoothing out the surface and they look almost like wax. So when I denoised it, it made it look even smoother and la more lackluster. Um, so this is where I added some grain very selectively when I brought it back into um, Lightroom to give it a, a, a little more texture, um, not any more than it originally had in nature, but just to bring some of that detail back where it looked just a little too waxy to me. Um, did a number of other things to bring out the contrast. Um, I used the clarity slider, the uh, texture slider, and also brought it into Color Effects Pro to bring out some of the detail. Because um, the, the texture and the, the, the ceiling and in the back of this image were just really, really incredible. But again, the way the raw file came out, um, it, it didn't show up. Um, part of the problem was also that there was a lot of moisture in this area and a very soft mist rising up off of the water. And with the lights shining on that directly into that area on the lake, reflecting off of the lake, reflecting off of the rocks behind it, that mist, which was really mystical when you looked at it with the naked eye in the image, just made the whole the whole picture look very hazy and glaring. Um, so I had to take a lot of time to get rid of that glare using the dehaze tool in Lightroom, um, but then uh, doing some other selective uh, adjustments in Lightroom as well. Um, I love the selective masking tools and, and adjustments for doing stuff like this. Um, one of the problems was where the lights were situated, um, the, the most yellow rock on the right side towards the top was not quite blown out, but it was way overexposed because the light was shining right on it. Mm -hmm. So I did some selective um, uh, dodging there. Um, did some selective uh, dodging down in the, the forefront of the rocks or, or down by the, the foreground where I wanted to put back in some of those shadows because again, the, the, the shadows, the contrast with the shadows and the light was really striking to me, but I didn't want the shadows to be so black that it lost the detail. Um, but um, also you'll notice on the left-hand side, uh, the rocks that are on the bottom half, 
way on the left side of the picture are not really as well focused um, as I would like it to have been. Um, I did shoot this at uh, 5.6, which again is the equivalent of f11, but for when the rocks are so close to the camera um, compared to my focal point, which was in the back of that lake where those crystallized structures are. Um, I just didn't have the depth of field that I wanted. So I had to do some selective um, adjustments with that to increasing clarity even more, adding some more grain to that, um, adding a little more contrast so that it doesn't look as out of focus as it did in the raw image. Um, but then I also had to remove quite a few wires and lights. And I see I missed one wire that somebody else pointed out to me. It's kind of hanging down from the top. It looks like a snake. I didn't notice it until I had actually printed this image off. Um, but there was a couple of large spotlights that I took out with um, generative fill and Photoshop. Uh, worked real well, just as easily as it did when Joe demonstrated it to you. Um, but also had to put some color back into it. Um, did not increase set saturation, but um, instead uh, set my black point and my white point to the black. When you set your black point, it does tend to bring the colors out a little more. But I also added a um, kind of a soft, um, warm color filter to the top of the whole thing to bring out some of those oranges and yellows a bit. Um, can't remember what else I did. I did a lot. I probably spent three three or four hours on this image um, and in three different programs. Wow. Wow, that's absolutely stunning, you know? Absolutely <clears throat> stunning. Wow. So, how big is this scene? Uh, I'm not a good judge of, of distance. Um, I would say, um, if I had to guess, think of it as a size of a a car lengthwise widthwise and maybe uh heightwise too about it's about that size it's not huge okay. uh, in that sense <clears throat> yeah so um you made a point there you made a point there uh Elaine and maybe we didn't mention this in the back of your camera if you're shooting raw, you can have something called picture styles or picture controls that, and you can set your camera to be like vivid or landscape, which when you look at it from a raw perspective, it will look more like what we see here in a sense, as opposed to the flat one that you have. So maybe that would be something we might want to, you might want to do is set it to the picture styles to give you the more vib vibrance in the colors you, so that you won't be as disappointed. I know we did that yesterday down at uh, Maple Press. We thought that most of those shots were gonna be black and white. So we can't set our camera to display the image in black and white. We use raw, but it displayed on the back of the camera and in the viewfinder as black and white. But yet if we could always go back to color if we wanted to. Whereas if you were to do that in JPEG and you did it in uh, black and white, you could never go back to color. So I'm just suggesting based upon what you mentioned there that we might want to do that um, to help with that visual. That's a, good, that's a good idea. It doesn't actually affect the raw file though. It just affects right. what you see in your viewfinder or on the LED screen to give you a better idea of what you need to adjust. Right. Is that correct? So let me uh, let's see what, some more questions, and uh, we can um, go back to our little so, slide. Yes, I have two questions, okay. um, and I know we talked about manual mode, um, but would this scene be maybe something that would be a a good option for HDR? Um, it it could be. It could be very much so. And that's a really good point you made there. It could be a really good HDR image. And if you, I would suggest if you did that, uh, and if your camera has the capability of doing bracketing HDR, but keeping it as raw, 
as opposed to it may have a capability of doing an HDR and doing it in camera and generating a JPEG. I would suggest you don't do that. I would suggest you take the bracketed images, maybe three or four, and do them um, handheld and have the raw files and then bring them back together in Lightroom because you have a much more robust capability of handling and dealing with HDR in Lightroom or whatever program you use as opposed to doing it in the camera. But that is an excellent thought. And I, this would be a perfect example for something like that. That is a really good thought. And I'm glad you mentioned that. So I will say that the second time we went, I did some exposure bracketing because um, I wanted to see what what would happen with it. Um, and I was kind of disappointed, but I do believe that it was because I was did not use enough, didn't didn't indicate enough images in the program, and there was like two stops between each image, which was too much. So the the darkest photo was way too dark and the lightest one was way too bright. So I ended up throwing out um, like the uh, three out of the five images. And when I merged them it, overall, it was just too overexposed. So I think if you do that, you kind of have to practice with those parameters, how many images you're gonna use and how many f-stops between the shots to get a good HDR well, image. <clears throat> Right. And, and the other challenge is, right, when I typically do HDR, I'm doing it while on aperture priority mode. Well, in this case, because we're, we're really almost wanting to do it on, on the speed, right, the shutter speed, because you don't want to be changing the aperture um, too often. Well, you would want to be changing the shutter speed. Well, actually... Um, so that you're not getting mixed depths of field, right? Right. I think you want. I think on this case, you'd want to use uh, very the ISO rather mm -hmm. than the shutter speed or the uh, f-stop. The shutter speed, you're going to be at a low shutter speed, and for you to bring more light in, you're maybe taking it from one twentieth of a second, if that's what you shoot at, down to one tenth of a second, and your chances of getting motion blur are really high. You know, so I would right. I would use the ISO as the um, uh, variable in the HDR. I think uh, Joe that you can, depending upon your camera, um, there is a way to use aperture priority. Um, with auto ISO and tell your camera that the slowest mm -hmm. I want to go is say 1 30th of a second. And at that point, ISO, um, ISO might pick up and in, in increase um, incrementally after maybe 1 25th of a second. I can put those parameters in my camera so that it's usually, it's, it's adjusting both your shutter speed and the ISO um, in, a, in a sequential order. Uh, so that you're not, it doesn't ever cause the shutter speed to be too slow. And it would only kick in the ISO when it absolutely has to. Cool. Um, Last question that I have, um, and I think Saturday is not going to be too bad, but have you had uh, any is issue with, uh, especially when you first get there, moisture fogging up on the front of your lens? Mm, no, I, I don't think you're going to have that as an issue because it's 52 degrees and we didn't have any issues at all of that uh, going from a warm car into a, a cooler environment. I know that, that's not enough of a differential, I don't think, to encompass that. I was just in the, some very, very cold weather last week and I'm very attuned to that. And we didn't have that issue because there wasn't a dramatic amount of um, moisture and temperature difference. And I don't think you're gonna have that here. Cool. A bit of dripping maybe. So bring, <laughs> bring <laughs> yeah. an umbrella. Yeah. <laughs> umbrella, yeah. Can we bring umbrellas? Shower no. cap or something. Um, but <laughs> would, would you would you focus stack this? Uh, you you could, and and this would be a prime example for focus stacking. Let me stop this for a minute and go back to our little uh, PDF that we have, and um, <clears throat> share screen and our PDF. Come on, can you see it? Yep. Yep. Okay. And PDF. 
which is completely optional. There's a number of, a real brief, just so people know what we're talking about, is if this is a scene and you have trees, some real close, some in the middle and some far away, you take three shots, one gets these in focus, one that gets the middle ones in focus, and one gets the background in focus. You take the three images and you take them into Photoshop and there's a very simple process that merges only the sharp parts and you get everything in um, focus by doing what's called focus stacking. Stack one, stack two, stack three. You can go stack four, five, six, seven, 10, 20. Uh, typically in, in, in these, I would think a three or four stack would be a plenty uh, and you could do that, okay? And the concept is that you take an image and I, and I didn't, I should have put up one here for uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, caverns, but I didn't. So you would focus, you, you would, it, the camera would take a picture here, 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 and here with the idea that each, these are gonna be all in focus, these would not, this is gonna be in focus, this may or, but this would not be. So you take all of these pieces that have been photographed by you or the camera and put them together in Photoshop or some programs and produces a really tack short image from the foreground to the background. And there's a number of different ways to do that. And I have a technique that I can't write up because it's it takes too many words and blah, blah, blah. But I can show you when we get there how you can do it handheld manually. And I think it works very well. It works very well for me and I've been doing it for years where I can get tack sharp by manually focusing here, framing the image, focus here, frame the image, focus here, frame the image, focus here, frame the image, and then combining them. And I will show you that if you want to do that. For us to get into focus stacking right now, that's another hour and a half program uh, to go through the whole process. But the caverns is a perfect place to do it. And I would recommend that you generate the raw files and do it in Photoshop as opposed to doing it in camera. My suggestion. Did I answer that? Did we answer that one? Yes, thank you. Jim? And Jim, I know you, your your new camera has that built in and, uh, and I can show you uh, how you can do that on yours. And if anybody has a Nikon camera, we can uh, I can show you multiple ways to do it. And if you don't have a Nikon camera, there's another way you can do it manually. And I can show you that too, but it takes a little bit of practice. Any other questions? Yeah. So Elaine, we need to be there at eight o'clock, right? Oh, well, you and I need to be there a few minutes earlier, but yeah. yes, the, the group needs to be there by eight o'clock. Um, we will have to register. You will each have to purchase your ticket with cash in the exact amount, please, and um, or a check made payable to um, Indian Echo Caverns. Uh, we will also be asked to sign a liability waiver, which will take a few extra minutes for each of you. Um, and at when we've all got our tickets and we will kind of divide in, in two groups, we'll get a quick orientation with a few rules about going into the caverns, but a little history in the caverns itself. Um, and then we'll head down to the caverns by 8.30. And then we have it from 8.30 to what, 9.30? Um, no, we actually have it until 10.15. 10, 10, 10.15, okay. We have lots of time in there, yeah. And if you need to, and if you want to or need to get out early, that's not a problem because they are going to have all the lights on the whole way so you can actually um, get out. And you, frankly, you can't get lost, okay? If you, if you just sort of follow the path, you can, you can get around. They also have little maps that I believe they're going to be handing out. Will they not, Joe? Uh, I, I hope so. They're... Um, but I wouldn't count on it, frankly, <laughs> <laughs> because I, I, the caps, the maps didn't mean anything to me. I could not figure out where I was. And even on the second time, I just, 
but myself but yeah you're in the wedding room okay it doesn't say wedding room there's no sign that says wedding room but We're going to be there to help, and uh, Elaine and I will have our cameras, but our goal is to be with one of us with each group and uh, to help you with any issues or give you some suggestions or whatever. So we're going to be there to help you. But please understand setting the shutter speed, the f-stop, and the ISO, and know those down cold. Okay. Anything else? Well, guys, we'll see you on Saturday morning. Thank you, Joan Elaine. Thank you, Joan Elaine. Thanks, Joan Thank Elaine. You. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you Saturday. See you then. Take care. Bye now. Bye-bye. I've got to stop the, okay, I am going to end the meeting. Any Anybody else hanging around that we need to, uh, let me see. I don't think so. Well, I think we're done. Right, Elaine? Okay.